Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? What a lovely day. Just picked up the papers. The, uh, have to pay for this myself and then get it back out of petty cash. But I never remember. So it's like a nice little bonus when it builds up. It's uh, £3.80 a day. So 380 times 5 is uh, £19 a week. So it builds up, you know. <coughs> Pardon me. Oh. It's one of those bright days where uh, the uh, exposure is going to be wrong. So, oh, June. June is my busiest month. Is it your busiest month? Do you know? You should do. I did a bit of research about uh, six months ago on which month is, you know, we had the most patients coming in. And uh, if you'd asked me in advance which month it was going to be, I would have said February or March or something or September, but really didn't expect it to be June. June. June's a funny month because you think it's like a, the su a summer month and a holiday month and um, but in fact it's not it's a weird month isn't it it's a sort of month that's sort of stuck between spring and what we really think of as the summer which is August so apparently it's the month where people feel that they've got enough money to get their teeth fixed so uh, <clears throat> problem is I'm going off on holiday on the 16th of June which is a dumb decision for two reasons one is that uh, it's going to keep me away for the last week of the month which is the week in which I have to make sure that there's enough money in the account to pay the bills and, and do the payroll and stuff like that so I'm going to end up doing the payroll on holiday and then the uh, And the second problem is, of course, that I'm going away in June, which is my busiest month. And if I had any sense, June would be the last month I'd take a holiday. But uh, I don't know what my brain was thinking. I think it was thinking something along the lines of, uh, I'll get a commercial advantage if I'm open in August when everyone else is shut. Therefore, I'll take a holiday in June so that I can stay open in August. Or, or you know or not quite along those lines but sort of you know it doesn't matter if I sneak away in June because then I can work through the summer which will be good so but the problem is that um, you know I, I then found out that June was the busiest month or forgot that I'd found out and uh, so I'm off so I've got to what's it today something or other it's a Friday Friday the 8th so I'm off a week tomorrow and I've got next week to literally uh, do everything for the entire month you know make sure all the money's in the account payrolls done and everything so I can go away so next week's gonna be just mental my uh, I've made the receptionist redundant so that's it she's gone now she's uh, noticed she's served her gardening leave I've paid her I've paid her redundancy pay had to give her pretty much three months off on full pay and then and then another three months full pay so I mean if the government's objective is to make sure that you go bust as a small business then they couldn't do any better I must say they are they're overperforming in that respect I mean how they think that any firm that has to make anyone redundant uh, certainly on the grounds of saving money which is the usual grounds um, can, can afford to pay three months wages up front to everyone who leaves you know it's just I mean I know from a political point of view it's bad for them for people to be losing jobs but you can't you can't penalize gov companies into employing people you know there seems to be this sort of right you know this, this sort of idea that everyone's got a right to a job and everyone's got a right to be employed and everyone's got a right to a salary and there's nothing could be further from the truth nothing this I noticed this with um, British Association of Dental Nurses and, and Pam Swain you know the 
this sort of attitude that dental nurses had a right to be registered on the General Dental Council and they had a right to, you know, in most circumstances have their registration paid for and uh, they have a right to this and a right to that and and I said it would all you know, backfire and that uh, and being a dental nurse will be just end up being ri ridiculously restrictive and um, expensive and much less flexible than it is at the moment and that's absolutely you know that's how it's worked out uh, the government is <clears throat> I'm not going to go on an anti-government rant but it very rarely intervenes in things in a way which makes them any better and almost always makes them worse so for example I mean one one of the things that we've had to do is pay into this pension scheme now now can they can they integrate it into the pension can they integrate it into PAYE? It's a completely different system. It's a completely different website. I think that's because they wanted like a multiplicity of providers, you know, to provide the illusion of choice. And yet most people have probably gone with Nest. And uh, and so. Um, so what's happened is that we've been forced to make these look ridiculously small but annoying payments like of like £100 a month or £150 a month or something to people's pensions which is we know is going to get stolen I mean it's not like <clears throat> this is not going to make any difference to anybody's quality of life this is a last ditch attempt to prop up the pension Ponzi that the government is running where they, all the time that the population was young uh, and uh, of working age, this Ponzi carried on because they, they, they had no pot and uh, so they paid uh, the benefits out of the current income. The, the very definition of a Ponzi, the very definition. <laughs> so well, Bernie Madoff would be so proud of them. And, uh, and yet, <clears throat> and no intention of uh, building up a pot either you know no no attempt to build up a pot just underwriting everybody's pension with the full faith and confidence of the British government you know, uh, like the, 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 the money you know backed by nothing but a promise and, and uh, not much of a promise a promise a bankrupt's promise <laughs> to pay you <laughs> so uh, this hundred pounds you know they're like oh well Sorry guys, you know, we haven't got any money, but uh, where could we could perhaps get the employers to try and try and uh, get make give these guys a pension, you know? And the, only, the only problem being that the amounts are so small, they're not going to make any difference unless you're in your like, late teens, early 20s. And uh, <clears throat> secondly, it's being invested by the government. So it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to come to anything. And uh, they're hoping that they can start the payment small, I think, and then ramp them up, you know, until eventually people will be paying their national insurance and and the employers will be paying their pensions as well. But it's just, uh, for, sort of, for my staff who are in the sort of 40s and 50s, it's just an extra tax. It's just taking £100 <coughs> out of the business that they could earn in wages. Um, <coughs> And, and just giving it to the government to fritter away. It's going to vanish. No, nobody will ever see it. You know, except in some uh, some sort of ridiculously pathetic top up to their state pension, which was going to be com completely have no purchasing power because it, by then it'll be completely devalued by the two percent inflation a year. You know, which robs you the inflation tax, which robs you purchasing power. Anyway, I'm digressing a bit because my point really was that um, uh, the main problem from my point of view is not so much the £100, although it does all add up and, and £100 it does do us some damage. Um, you know, it's another hole. It's a small hole below the waterline and then if you get enough small holes below the waterline you sink, don't you? But, but they always work on the basis of well, what's one one more small hole below the waterline. You know? 
the main problem is that just the, the agro involved in learning how the scheme works and it's never, never, never straightforward and complicated. There's always two ways you could possibly work it out, three ways you could possibly work it. And then you have to uh, you have to take the figures off your payroll and then you have to type them into the pension scheme and then... Uh... So anyway, um, I mean, the gist of this story is that, as a result, you know, I think I think the redundancy of the uh, receptionist, who was also the practice manager, I think it can be attributed in part to the, the the increased bureaucracy. You know, in other words, in other words, they tried to give her a pension, and she ended up getting made redundant. So now she's got nothing. She's got no salary. She's got no pension. And my the, my pension contributions have gone down, my wages have gone down, um, you know, and so everyone's working harder than they used to, but um, from her point of view, what, what has she gained, you know? What does the government gain if it tries to give everybody a pension and then, and then ends up reducing the workforce by a third, which is what it has done in our place? Now I'm seriously worried about the profitability of the independent dentist. I think I have a sneaking suspicion that the independent dentist is not profitable. Honestly, I can't. I mean, the redundancy payment that I had to make, I had to pay into the practice myself out of my own personal funds because the business did not have the money to make the redundancy payment. So, so. You know, if if it, if things don't work, they don't work. You know, if the business is if it's not possible to be profitable as a small dentist, then that is a that's the end of the small dentist. You know, it's like I always used to say, uh, Ken Weech, our parliamentary advisor at the DP GDPA, used to say, saving money is great. It's like the farmer who uh, decided to save money by every week feeding his horse slightly less, which was a strategy which worked extremely well until the horse died. Um, you know, you're, the, the, these guys don't know. They don't know when the horse is going to die. And I think the small, the private, independent dentist practice is the horse that is going to die. So I don't think that, you know, guys like myself who value our independence and who probably wouldn't ever work for a corporate, um, just on quality grounds really more than anything um, are will you know will not be replaced uh, it's a shame because we are like the last real link I mean we're the generation underneath the generation that were the the private dentists when when dentistry went private in 1948 uh, when went uh, when the NHS started and you know and the private dentists went into the NHS in 1948 and then they, they were the teachers, the tutors and the mentors that uh, produced my generation of dentists. And we had their sort of same pride in the technical side of the work and also the, the, the people side of it and the, um, the professionalism, you know, the fact that uh, doctors are not, doctors and dentists are, you know, are doing things which are equally difficult in their own ways. Um, are both worthy professions. But uh, we are, I mean, I had, a, I had a guy in the other day who had a clotting problem and I asked, I just wanted to, I actually was quite happy to do the extraction in, in, in general practice. But out of courtesy, I wanted to run it past his GP just to check that his GP was happy for him to have an extraction done in general practice. And uh, the GP, of course, wasn't there because they don't work that day. They can't take a phone call. They can't tell me this. They can't tell me that. Um, and uh, said they'd ring back. And then when they rang back, they rang him. They didn't ring me because they rang the patient. They didn't ring the person who'd rung them, who they'd asked to ring back. So, so, um, so then I'm faced with this patient ringing me up and say oh my doctor rang me this morning and said everything's going to be fine you know don't you really worry about it my doctor said it's, it's, there's no problem you can go ahead and I'm like really am I supposed to accept that your word that your doctor said it was okay you know 
and in the end, I mean, I had to because there's no, I can't, I can't get in touch with this bloody doctor. And I, she had one chance to get in touch with me, and she blew it. And then there's another uh, incident yesterday where I had a, a woman in who got a swelling uh, underneath her eye in a in a cheek, you know, and which I believe is related. I vitality tested all all of her teeth. And uh, the upper right five came up as non-vital, so it's a bit of an odd place for the five to blow up. But I mean, it's not impossible, uh, and it's certainly not a molar or anything. So um, I said to her, "No, it looks like your five is testing like dead as a dodo." Uh, I'll give it some antibiotics. We actually dispensed them on site. I actually uh, recommended that she has two straight away, and then the third one in the evening. This is broad spectrum amoxil. And uh, the next day I get an email saying, uh, my swelling's got bigger, I've gone to the doctor. And the doctor said that, uh, come back tomorrow if it gets worse. Plus, when you go to the dentist, you might like to suggest that they take an x-ray. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck, what the fuck, you know, but this, is extremely, it's extremely difficult to keep your cool when a series of events like that happens, you know. You're, you're not only has the patient decided that you're not, you don't have a clue what you're doing, so she's going to seek help from a higher authority, someone who probably knows more about teeth than you do, i.e. her doctor. And secondly, when the doctor then gives you gratuitous advice, which is painfully wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you do? Do you, do you, you know, you're, you're, let me just first, for anyone who's not sure, spell out why an x-ray is no use in a case of acute infection. It's because x-rays, all they do is they show hard tissues. And so in a case of a chronic infection, where the infection has had a chance to make some difference to the hard tissues by usually by dissolving bone which you can see as a periapical radiolucency then uh, they may be useful as a as a you know and they're obviously useful in cysts and uh, you know uh, duct stones and ducts and things like that I mean x-rays have their use they have no part at all to play in the diagnosis and treatment of acute infections because by definition they happen very suddenly uh, the pus tracks straight into the soft tissues it caught a very very small amount of pus causes an exaggerated response which is the swelling the immediate you know the immediate swelling um, usually the, the relief of pain as well because the pressure from the pus in the bone goes away but the pain goes away the face swells up very quickly there's absolutely no point taking an x-ray you're far better off doing a vitality test than an x-ray and the doctor doesn't even know what a vitality test is. Probably the doctor does not even know what vitality testing is. And, uh, you know, come back and see me tomorrow if it's got worse. It's just kicking the can down the road, isn't it? What the doctor should have said was, it sounds to me as though your dentist has got the whole thing under control you are not really, you're not really getting any benefit from being here um, other than taking up an appointment, you may as well just go back to your dentist. That's what the doctor should have, but the doctor of course is under so much pressure to be, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah, I know all about that, yeah. Oh yeah, they should have, did they not take an x-ray? Oh no, they should have done that. So, you know, and you get all this crap, this patient comes back thinking they're being helpful. So, and I'm thinking, well, actually what I'd rather do is I'd rather write uh, uh, an email to the patient back saying, well, yeah, you know, uh, x-rays are no, next time you see your doctor, can you just tell him that x-rays are no use in these circumstances, you know? But then what do you do? You just, you've got, you know, you're not, it's not up to you to uh, manipulate the patient into telling the doctor what a pillock they are. 
you're you just have to swallow it don't you you just have to say yeah 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 well with you know i'll say to the patient when they come in there's no point taking an x-ray in fact i'll go even further than that i shall say the doctor really doesn't know what they're talking about but then you're sort of you you know the patient's going to get upset because it was their decision to go and see the doctor and you're sort of saying no well you you needn't have done that or you shouldn't have done that you know you shouldn't have done that you're wasting the doctor's time doctors know nothing about teeth and then it all seems very defensive doesn't it and very sort of oh you know i'm i'm like <laughs> like the pharmacist you know <laughs> i'm a pharmacist you know <laughs> i don't love I don't want to be like that. I'd rather just be like, yeah, all right, we want to see you, doctor. That's fine. That's fine. It's not a problem. Now let's get on with the problem of your teeth and sorting out your teeth. You know. So it's Friday morning. We've got one of our nurses doing a radiography course. The most ridiculous, the most ridiculous, stupid syllabus. Any -E BDN, you pellex. You know, she's. She's been asked to do a lateral ceph. She's been asked to do an occlusal uh, view. Both, both x-rays that I haven't seen or done since the 1980s. X-rays which are no longer done outside very, very, very specialist departments. X-rays which, you, you know, have to be completed as part of, the, of the, this qualification, but which can't be completed. It's impossible to complete them because you can't find anywhere that will allow just some random nurse to come in and, and, and train them to set up this x-ray and then allow them to carry out the exposure, you know, because, because the liability is all up in the air regarding who's liable for what. So any BDN allows the nurses to simulate these x-rays. You're allowed to pretend to do them. But then you can't, I mean, you the periapicals and everything are what we do. The OPG, we refer to QEQM anyway. So, and you're not allowed to simulate OPGs. So, you know, there's no point any nurse doing this this course unless you've got an OPG machine in the practice, which is too much aggro. And then the woman who's supposed to be the, uh, the supervising tutor decides to go on holiday in the week before the deadline. I mean, it's just, it's just, and then, and then, she's not even allowed to take x-rays until she's done the exam, which is in the autumn. I mean, you know, I mean, way to go. Way to go, any BDN. You get my prize of the day for being pillock of the day, any BDN. Right, okay, rant's over. I'll uh, see you all tomorrow. Bye.